And welcome everyone who is um, joining us this morning for Shravasti Abbey's Buddhist Action to Feed the Hungry. As I was looking at the list of people who are online, I think most of you know us, um, but maybe not everyone. So we are Shravasti Abbey. My name is Tupton Chuni. I'm a resident here. Um, we are a Buddhist monastery in the Tibetan tradition in uh, Eastern Washington state. And we are um, very happy to have this day of our Buddhist action to feed the hungry, a day of Dharma sharing to support the really wonderful, excellent work of Buddhist global relief. We've long admired Buddhist global relief and the careful and thoughtful and extremely effective work that they do. Some of our nuns have had the opportunity actually to do some um, walks to feed the hungry in the past. And so this year when BGR invited us to host an event online because walks to feed the hungry are maybe not so safe in different places. Anyway, we were delighted to do so. And so here we are. Um, and we're delighted to introduce our friends from Shabasti Abbey to Buddhist Global Relief. So to do that, I want to introduce Carla Prater, who is the assistant director, an assistant director at Buddhist Global Re Relief, who will get us going with um, who they are. Good morning, everybody. It's so good to be here with you. For over 10 years, we have gathered each year for Buddhist Global Relief's Walks to Feed the Hungry, coming together to raise funds to support our mission of relieving chronic hunger and malnutrition all over the world. These have really been fun occasions to get together and to see, meet other supporters, learn about our work, and spread the word in our communities about BGR, as well as raising funds to support our mission. However, like many organizations, we have needed to make some changes in our operations due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And one big change we have made is moving most of our fundraisers online. So we're very happy to have you join us in this virtual space. In addition to the need to move much of our lives online, this pandemic continues to ravage lives and livelihoods around the world. And it's fueling a hunger crisis in the US and globally. Hunger is one of the most devastating secondary effects of the COVID pandemic's depressing effects on economic activity. Estimates globally are that this pandemic is causing some 10,000 additional deaths among children each month. An estimated 50, uh, 550,000 children rather are suffering from wasting caused by extreme malnutrition due to the effects of the pandemic. The anti-hunger organization Feeding America estimates that the COVID pandemic will re result in some 10 to 17 million more Americans needing, needing food supplements because they are food insecure. We already have some 37 million Americans, even before the pandemic, that were food insecure. That's one tenth of the American population. In response to this hunger crisis, BGR has provided more than $54,000 to support food banks and food distribution centers in the US and $2,100 this year for food support worldwide. We're gathering today to help raise more funds for BGR's hunger relief efforts. We'll hear from Shravasti Abbey community. We'll also hear directly from a few of our many partner organizations who are doing the work with our projects that we support. And their representatives are gonna give us a nice peek into their work, the work that you support with your donations. Also a representative of a local food bank there in the Newport area will speak to us and explain how they are meeting hunger needs in Newport, Washington. We'll also hear from the founder and chair of, BQ, of BGR, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. The COVID crisis is increasing the numbers going hungry every day. These numbers that I've cited are changing all the time and only in one direction. So we need you to step up and help us help others. Help us by donating generously and by telling your friends about what we're doing and how they can help. Thank you very much. And now, Venerable Shani of Shabasti Abbey. So I'm going to invite Venerable Tupton Chidron, who again probably doesn't need much introduction to many of you. Um, but I do want to say, Venerable Tupton Children, our founder, our abbess, author, teacher, 
Also our guiding star and inspiration in um, bringing our Buddhist practice into social activism and to be engaged with the suffering of the world. So um, she has some things to share with us. Well, welcome everybody. I'm very happy to participate in this because uh, hunger is a cause dear to my heart as is girls' education. And I hear that uh, BGR is also involved in educating young girls, which I'm very happy to hear about. So if you're of my generation, uh, when you were a little kid, you might have heard like I heard when I didn't want to finish everything on my plate. Children are starving in China. You need to eat. Yeah. That didn't do much to convince me to eat the food I didn't like. Okay. But it did make me aware of what was happening in the rest of the world. And when I grew older, I started learning more about the rest of the world. And indeed, during that time, uh, children in China were starving. When I uh, got into Buddhism, I went to India and lived, uh, you know, in mostly rural areas there. And indeed, there too, uh, hunger was a big thing. And I saw myself and my own stinginess in confront of that. There was sometimes a civil war going on between uh, seeing the need and my fear that if I gave, I wouldn't have because I was living in India with almost no money at that time and no ticket back. So I remember um, walking to the market in Dharamsala uh, to buy some vegetables. I did this every week. And along the road uh, were the, uh, the people with leprosy. And they would sit there. And they were our lepers. They lived in the community. So we, we knew them, you know. And we passed them regularly, and we knew where they lived. Uh, but when I was going to buy vegetables, um, I had a really hard time giving them 25 pace, which at that time was the price of a cup of tea. Because there was fear in me that if I gave that, then I wouldn't have enough money for myself. And yet, I would look at their lives, and I would have in my mind uh, the words of my teacher, Geshe Nawandarge, from earlier that morning about being generous, caring for all sentient beings, wanting to attain Buddhahood for all sentient beings. And I couldn't even give uh, the price of a cup of tea. So this set up some kind of discord, you could say, <laughs> yeah, within my own heart. And it's been something that I've worked with, uh, had to work with over the years, yeah, uh, because the feeling of shared humanity is very strong, yeah. We're all in the same position in samsara. And uh, some of us may have a little bit more tea, money for tea than others, uh, but that's not secure in samsara. We go up and down and up and down. And I was quite aware that my own stinginess would be the cause of my own poverty in the future, which of course I didn't want. So, you know, it's been a process really <clears throat> to do that and pay more attention to the sense of shared humanity and the sense of we're all in this world together and I can't just look out for myself and I can't just say, 
oh, I'm in America and I have uh, lots of food and children in China are starting, starving and even adults in India are starving and Africa, you know, the picture from, again, from my childhood that is so strong was the vulture sitting next to that little boy. I'm sure uh, some of you remember that photo, the emaciating child with the vulture sitting next to him. Uh, and, and seeing that, you know, we have a universal responsibility to help each other. And especially, I think, during the pandemic, when the pandemic is affecting everybody, and when we may have food today, but we don't know what's going to happen in the next six months or in the next 12 months. Yeah. And especially, uh, you know, with I think a lot of people are, who are online are from the US, uh, the tension about the election and what's going to happen after that. So now is the time really when um, we have the material wherewithal to reach out and share it with others. Yeah, uh, because we're the fortunate ones right now. And in previous lives, we weren't the fortunate ones. Who knows next year or, or next life, whether we'll be fortunate, depends a lot on the karma we create in this lifetime. Yeah, so to, to really um, be of benefit, not just as a way to protect ourselves, that's kind of uh, looking out for next life is good, but it's also quite self-centered. So I think really opening our hearts with that feeling of uh, we're all in this together and it doesn't matter who's hungry, as long as there's hunger, it's something to be overcome. Um, so that's what I have to say. Then I'm, I am also supposed to introduce Bhikkhu Bodhi, which is very delightful to do. I will not tell you his biography, you can read that. You know, he received this degree and that degree and had all sorts of uh, jobs that he did for, in Sri Lanka, publishing Buddha books, Buddhist books, all of which were completely wonderful. And that's how I first heard about him. Okay, so before I even met him, his reputation came first, you know, about being this wonderful scholar and translator and, you know, kind of one of the senior Theravada monks and so on. So then a number of years ago, I can't even remember how long, um, but it wasn't too much longer after he came back from Asia. Uh, we were both at a Western Buddhist monastic conference uh, in outside of Washington, DC. And this was the first time I had uh, met Bhikkhu Bodhi, but in the conference, I hadn't yet met him in when it was my turn to give the a talk, okay? So they had put me in a slot to give a talk. I hadn't made his acquaintance yet in the conference, in the gathering by then. Uh, but my conference topic was bhikshuni ordination, okay? So uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, this is a very controversial topic especially, you know, many years ago. And my experience with Theravada monks beforehand was uh, bhikshuni ordination, impossible. Don't you dare ask. You have to wait until Maitreya Buddha comes because the lineage has been, you know, it is no longer existent now. So just be content with what you have, play your role, be a humble nun, and then pray for next life, you can be a man. So yeah, I had heard that stuff and it, you know, 
And here I was, I'm going to give a talk about Bhikshun ordination and the importance of it. And he's like the senior uh, Theravada bhikkhu at the conference. And I didn't know him at all. And I'm going, okay, uh, you know, take a deep breath. You've got to tell the truth. And you tell it. And if you get nailed afterwards or criticized or ask gazillions of questions, um, you're just going to have to endure it. So I gave the talk yeah, about the importance of Bhikshuni ordination because I had, uh, 1986, I had take, received, and received the ordination in Taiwan and it was a very powerful thing for my own practice. So I gave the talk, the talk kind of looking over at Bhikkhu Bodhi to see what expression was on his face and wondering what I was going to hear after the talk. Um, but then during the Q&A time, he raised his hand and he started talking about how he thought it was very important to have bhikshunis. And I was like, oh my goodness, wow amazing and since then i've gotten to know bhikkhu bodhi um because he's been incredibly generous with his time and with his knowledge as i've been working on a series of books with his holiness the dalai lama and bhikkhu bodhi has been so generous in sharing time and help um going through the parts of the manuscript on the Pali tradition. And even many years ago, I went to uh, the monastery in New York and talked to him for days, asking him gazillions of questions. Again, very generous. So what I encountered when I met him was totally different than, <coughs> than what I had expected. And so here's a person who is, when he started um, Buddhist Global Relief, yeah, was he was really doing what His Holiness the Dalai Lama was telling the Buddhist community to do, which was be more active socially and help other beings more in this world. And here he was, the person, you know, starting this organization. And I thought, oh, He's doing tikkun olam, which is a Hebrew expression meaning repairing the world. So it's a, uh, a duty that we have as human beings to, uh, to help each other, to repair the brokenness in the world. And uh, so tikkun olam comes from the Jewish tradition, Bodhisattva, Bodhicitta, comes from the Buddhist tradition. And uh, in all of Buddhism, we find compassion and love, equanimity and joy emphasized so much. So with that, I would like to uh, invite Bhikkhu Bodhi to speak as he's an embodiment of all of this. Am I, am I on now? Okay, first I'd like to thank Venerable Tupton Children for that introduction and also Venerable Tupton Children and all of the nuns of Shravasti Abbey for agreeing to host this day of action to feed the hungry from their monastery in near Spokane, Washington. I visited that monastery when we had the Western Monastic Gathering, I think it was 2015. And I have to say, I was extremely impressed by this monastery. It's one of the really few six, extremely successful Buddhist monasteries established by a Western Buddhist monastic, primarily for Western Buddhist monastics. And all of the nuns were very, very kind and very well disciplined. And my impression was getting together very harmoniously. 
And since uh, Temple Tipton Children mentioned the Bhikshuni ordination, I also maybe I remind her that it was just in this very building where I'm staying right, speaking right now, downstairs, that a group of the nuns came together in 2007, I think it was in May, to plan for the Hamburg conference on Bhikshuni ordination. <laughs> and together we, <laughs> we had drafted the statement <laughs> that His Holiness the Dalai Lama was supposed to use at the end of that conference <laughs> to announce the validity of Bhikshuni ordination in the Tibetan tradition, <laughs> but which he didn't use. <laughs> but instead, instead he said that even though I'm the Dalai Lama, but I don't have the authority to make a decision like that on my own. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to speak a little bit about how Buddhist global relief came into existence. Sort of the more immediate cause was an article that I wrote for the Buddhist magazine called Buddha Dharma. I was invited in 2007, I believe, to write their essay, the sort of editorial essay. And long I had been pondering the way in which Buddhism in the United States was being adopted almost entirely as a kind of inward journey, an inward practice with the focus on meditation practice. And when people would speak about what is your practice, it would be either Vipassana or Zen or Dzogchen. So the practice is identified with the kind of meditation that they're doing. And I would look out at the world, particularly after I came back to the United States in 2002, I started to get access to the internet and I could see so much injustice and violence and oppression and suffering in the world. And it occurred to me that it should be part of our mission as Buddhists to also address not only the inward psychological distress and dissatisfaction and discontent that people are experiencing in their own minds, but also the real concrete, tactile, everyday, debilitating suffering that people face in their day-to-day -day lives all around the world. And so that thought was sort of festering in my mind. And when Buddha Dharma invited me to write that essay, I expressed my thoughts in that essay. And I said that it's turning out that Buddhism in America has become a kind of middle class or upper middle class luxury for well-educated people to entertain as a kind of almost like an intellectual plaything. And though we speak about suffering, but we hardly do anything to address the real concrete suffering that millions upon millions of people are facing every day in their lives. And so the essay was published and I didn't tell anybody about it, but some of my friends and students read the magazine and came across that essay and then started to discuss with me their felt this their feeling that we have to find some way as Buddhists to put the challenge that I presented in that essay into action, into practice. So we had a few rounds of initial discussions, and then we decided to form a Buddhist belief organization. And at the outset, we set up a very, very grandiose mission to address the various kinds of social, political, and environmental suffering that people are facing around the world, something very, very broad like that. But after a couple of days looking at that mission statement, we realized that it was necessary to have a more specific point of focus, that it was just too broad, too ambitious, too general for an organization which at that point consisted of about four people and nothing in their bank account. 
And so then we decided to choose a very specific focal point for the organization. And the problem, the suggestion that I made was to make the focus of the organization the problem of chronic hunger and malnutrition. And the reason I chose that particular focal point for the mission was also based on my own experience living in Asia, in my case in Sri Lanka, back in the early 1970s. When I came to Sri Lanka and I was living in a monastery in the countryside, just at that time, the government of Sri Lanka implemented a very, very stringent, austere economic policy. You know, now they speak about austerity as an economic policy, but I think Sri Lankan government at that time was the forerunner in imposing economic austerity. And as a result, the people in the area where I was living out in this remote village had very little food themselves. And so the temple where I was living had very little food. And so day after day, I was living on a really subs a bare subsistent di subsistence diet. And you know, when you get, when you go short of food for one day, two days, three days, you might say, if you're speaking with your friends, you say, oh, I'm starving. But I was experiencing this for week after week, month after month, altogether, it must've been a period of about 18 months where the, the, the meals consisted largely of just rice, a watery vegetable and, and watery dal. And so as a result of this, I don't feel the impact after a few days or even after a week or so, but when it's going on for week after week, month after month, I could feel the actual cells of my body crying out for nutrients, for vitamins and minerals. And this went on for, as I said, for about 18 months till the economic policy changed. And then people started to have food and then I was able to receive sufficient food. But through that period of, of the austere economic policy that when I was getting very, very little food of poor qualities, I came to understand what malnutrition, what hunger really means. And for that reason, when we decided to focus, to choose a more focused mission for BGR, I proposed using the problem of hunger and malnutrition. And though we started out with, the, the way we conceived of this mission initially was to provide direct food aid to communities that are suffering from deficient access to food. But over time, we came to see that there are deep underlying roots of poverty, hunger, and malnutrition. And one of these we came to learn was the opportunities that are denied to girls in many traditional cultures, the, especially the access to education, which is the means to uplifting oneself and one's families. And so we broadened the mission of BGR to include girl access to education for girls, because when girls receive education, then their voice is more respected within their families. They are delay the marriage and procreation of children, and they have a better understanding of nutrition. And then another side of the mission that also opened up was to promote vocational training for mature women so that they would have an opportunity to earn a greater income to support their families. So in this way, we came to have quite a broad range of secondary missions that come under the overall canopy of addressing chronic hunger and malnutrition. And I say this aspect of Buddhist global relief, what we are doing is I, I like to use a certain expression 
to characterize the kind of work that we're doing. You know, one of the most fundamental virtues in Buddhism that emphasized again and again by the Buddha, exemplified by the Buddha, and repeated throughout the Buddhist tradition is compassion, karuna or anukampa. But I want to qualify this compassion to avoid it from just becoming a beautiful rhetoric. And I use a qualifying adjective, I call it conscientious compassion. And that adjective conscientious mean, means that our commitment to the value of compassion is inspired by a sense of conscience, which means a willingness to take on responsibility for removing the suffering of others and for actively promoting the well-being and happiness of others. And so when we look out at the world, we see so many forms of real, concrete, tangible suffering afflicting people. And so while it's important for us as Buddhists to cultivate within our own minds the Brahma Viharas or divine qualities of loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy and equanimity, it's also critical that we give active expression to loving kindness and compassion through our deeds by taking action to alleviate the suffering that people, people unknown to us throughout the world are facing on a daily basis. And the, I would say the underlying foundation for all well-being is having sufficient nutrients, nutrition. Because what I found in my own experience back in Sri Lanka, when you are going hungry every day, when the body is deprived of its nutrients, the mind doesn't do anything but think about the next meal. I had at that time very little energy for meditation, little energy for study. As soon as the meal of one day is digested, I'm already thinking, waiting expectantly for that. I can hear the vibrations of the footprints coming from the main temple building to my little cottage. The patter of the footprints telling me that the attendant is coming with the food for the day, bringing me the food. My sense of hearing had become so sensitive that I could pick up that patter because I was waiting for it <laughs> from early in the morning, waiting just to hear the patter of the feet. Yeah, so if we're going to help people lead lives of dignity, meaning, purpose, to be able to live lives that are valuable to themselves and valuable <clears throat> to others, <clears throat> we have to provide the foundation. And that foundation is to look after their most fundamental material needs. And that is through providing food and providing the means for people to emerge from poverty through education and vocational training so that they can provide food for themselves, their families, and their communities in the future. Okay, so with that, I would like to conclude this little talk and proceed to the rest of the program. And again, I extend my deepest thanks and gratitude to Venerable Tupton Children and all of the nuns and community of Shravasti Abbey for hosting this event today. I guess I will be speaking next. Uh, my I name is uh, Vanda. Should I introduce yes. Kim Behan? <laughs> yeah, Kim Behan is the executive director of Buddhist Global Relief. And I'm almost at a loss of words to speak about the qualities of Kim Behan. <laughs> she joined our organization. She came for the first meeting that we had in 2008. And then in 2009, she 
at that time we had established a board, but we needed an executive director. And she had been working as a, what call it, a software engineer, was it? Yes. With a telecommunications corporation based in Colorado, Advaya, is that what it's called? Advaya. 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 And then she had gone through some surgery. She had a very, very serious threatening condition, um, like a kind of cyst that formed on the nerve of the eye close to the brain. And she had this, that was, could have like threatened her eyesight and even her spread to the brain. So she had a very delicate surgical operation to remove it. And then she was on leave from her work at, at Advaya. And at that time we needed an executive director. And then she decided to come through, I think this was 2009 and volunteered to become the executive director and took over that role, I think in June, 2009. And through the years now, now it's 11 years. She keeps very much in the background. She doesn't push her face and her personality into the foreground, but the amount of work that she does to promote the well being of people all around the world is truly monumental. I sometimes say if we had an alternative Nobel Prize, I would nominate her for that prize. <laughs> okay, Kim, you can take over now. Thank you so much, Bhante, for your generous introductions. I just, um, again, uh, my name is uh, Kim Behan, and um, as Bhante has uh, introduced, I'm the, uh, on the staff team of Buddhist Global Relief. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank Venbo Shodra and Venbo Choni, as well as the rest of the um, uh, Shravasti RB team for your kindness and generosity for organizing this event. And I'm also very honored to meet all the venerables and Dharma friends today. Um, at this point, I'd like to take a moment to share the work of Buddhist Global Relief, even though Venbo Bhikkhubodhi has basically touched on a lot of, of, of those points as well. So let me see if I can share my screen and, and uh, and bring up the uh, uh, BGR website. Oh, hold on. Yeah, it'll come, it'll come. Let me see, Bhante. Okay, do you see uh, the BGR website? Uh, basically, uh, as you can see the mission As you can see, the mission of Buddhist Global Relief is fourfold. Uh, we provide food aid to those afflicted by hunger and malnutrition. And in parallel with um, the hunger relief effort, um, we also provide education to children, especially girls, as well as livelihood, vocational training to women, so essential in the fight against poverty. And I think it's probably hard for you to see the last one. Also, uh, we support sustainable farming programs for uh, small scale farmers, many of whom are women, so they can provide um, livelihood, um, sustainable uh, you know, income for themselves and their families. Let me see if I would like to um, share another screen with you here. And this, uh, this map shows basically the projects that, uh, that, that we serve. Um, our projects take place in Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia from uh, Mongolia to uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, to India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Um, we also serve um, countries in Africa, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, um, Senegal, Uganda and others, and also um, South and Central America, Brazil, Peru, Nicaragua, um, Haiti, and right here in the US.
in 2008, when Bobby Kubode established uh, Buddhist Global Relief, uh, a nonprofit charity organization, and we basically started out with three projects. Today, we sponsor over 40 projects worldwide through your generous support. Um, at this point, um, I would like to introduce our partners uh, that are here with us today, What If Foundation and the Maitreya Charity. What If Foundation um, works in Haiti to provide life-sustaining nutrition to hungry children in the city of Port-au-Prince. And BGR has partners with What If Foundation since 2014 to support hunger relief an educational program, and we're very fortunate to have to be joined by Dave Manson, Executive Director of uh, What If Foundation. Dave, thank you for joining thank us. You. Thank you so much, and, and thank you to the family and community of, of Buddhist Global Relief and, and to the nuns and community at, at Sarasti Abbey for creating this amazing space today. Um, I have been moved and touched by all of the, the speakers so far and, and, and the spirit of compassion that seems to be flowing generously everywhere. And to, to, to all those that are, that are listening, we're, we're, we're extremely grateful. Um, we here at the, at the What If Foundation, I'm going to pull up a slide deck real quick and, and do a, a screen share, if I may. Um, let me make sure that I... See here. Is everybody able to see my screen, Kim? Yeah. Yes, Dave. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we are at the, at the What If Foundation. We are so incredibly grateful for, for the long-term partnership that we have enjoyed with uh, Buddhist Global Relief and all of those um, who support your compassionate mission to combat chronic hunger and malnutrition. Um, the particular focus that you have on supporting the education of girls and women and giving women opportunities to support their families has a special impact in Haiti. Um, and so we're really grateful that we've been given an opportunity to participate in uh, today's Buddhist action uh, to feed the hungry and to share with you uh, the impact that your support makes. Um, so I'd like to start with a little bit of, of background on Haiti to paint kind of a mental picture on the canvas of your mind to help form and frame the need. Um, Haiti is the poorest country in the Americas and the third poorest in the world. And the majority of Haiti's 11 million people live on less than $3 a day. There are over 400,000 children without parents in Haiti. One out of five children will die before the age of six. Uh, roughly three quarters of Haitians are either unemployed or they're trying to make ends meet in the informal economy and 75% of their people live in abject poverty. <laughs> of the 11 million population in Haiti, 49% of those folks are undernourished. Um, Haiti is fourth among, ranked in, among the countries most affected by extreme weather events. So when you see tropical storms uh, throughout the Caribbean region, uh, the impact on Haiti of those storms is so much more extreme uh, than, than elsewhere because of the lack of infrastructure, the erosion that has occurred in that country over decades. It, it's a huge impact. And Haiti ranks 169th out of 189 countries on the 2019 Human Development Index. So there are a significant number of challenges that BGR's work uh, with us in partnership helps to support and address. Uh, the, next, the next couple of slides are just some photos that for folks who have been to or traveled to developing nations will have an understanding of the, the nature of the, of the poverty that's there, the, the lack of water, clean, clean drinking water, the, the variety of different challenges that are faced by, by folks in those, in those regions. A um, little bit of background on, on the What If Foundation. Um, we were created in, in 2000 by Margaret Trost, uh, a young mother here in America, a business owner, and Father Gerard John Just, who's a celebrated Haitian human rights activist. Margaret met Father Jerry during an unexpected trip to Haiti and was deeply inspired by his commitment to social justice. She wrote, later wrote a book, On That Day Everybody Ate, which describes her remarkable journey and the birth of the What If Foundation. Father Jerry had a vision to create a children's food program, 
that could eventually become a stepping stone to a better future for his local community and beyond. And he told Margaret, first we feed the children, we keep them alive, and then we focus on education. And we've been working with the T Plus Cosmo community of Port-au-Prince ever since to fulfill Father Jerry's vision. The What If Foundation raises awareness and resources to support critically needed food, education, and community support programs in the T Plus Cosmo uh, neighborhood of Port-au-Prince and beyond. We work in close partnership with the Haitian grassroots organization, Narive, which has deep roots in the community, as well as the know-how and local relationships to have a significant impact on the ground. And together we've joined forces to bring hope and opportunity to children and their families for nearly 20 years. <coughs> Programs that we do support include food, education, disaster relief, and pilot projects. <coughs> And the What If Foundation and Buddhist Global Relief Partnership since 2010, when BGR first joined hands with What If Foundation to support our work in Haiti, BGR has helped to provide critically needed nourishment and alleviate hunger and food insecurity and support the educational needs of countless Haitian children and their families. BGR has provided funding to serve 253,529 meals and have funded 523 scholarships that enable children from T Plus Caso to attend school and pursue an education that would otherwise have been out of reach. BGR has provided critically needed funding to support the building of the Father Jerry School, which opened its doors in 2016. And the month after the Father Jerry School opened, Haiti was devastated by the impact of Hurricane Matthew and BGR came to the aid of Haiti with a special crisis release gift of $5,000. BGR has also provided much needed unrestricted to support to help enable the growth and development of the Haitian grassroots organization Narive and their leadership and community development efforts. The Lamange Food Program is the community food program located in the T Plus Caso community in Port-au-Prince. Um, since 2000, What If Foundation has been working in partnership with this community to help feed children who live in and around this impoverished urban neighborhood. For many children, it is their only meal of the day. Since we started in 2000, we served over 5,000 meals. Without this sustenance, they would be suffering from acute malnutrition. And without access to this program, they have no hope of breaking out of the cycle of poverty and no hope of creating a better future for themselves, their families, or their communities. This has become particularly important this year as the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting economic upheaval has exacerbated the already volatile and unstable government conditions and the growing gang violence. Our partners have worked tirelessly to meet the growing demand while practicing recommended health and safety guidelines. Each meal is lovingly prepared by Nari Bay staff and volunteers and includes a protein, vegetables, starch, and the traditional flavorings and seasonings of Haitian cuisine. And there are three components to the food program. The community program currently serves around 800 meals a, a, a day, every Monday through Friday. And this not only benefits the children and families who receive meals, but also has a large impact on the entire community by providing stability for families and a, and a strong sense of community and connection among those community members. And in September, 2016, the Father Jerry School opened its doors uh, it's built by the What If Foundation and operated by Narive. The school offers a rigorous curriculum with teachings of leadership and civic engagement. And 95% of students receive full or partial scholarships and have limited access to food at home. So providing a free meal to all students ensures that they are well fed and ready to learn. More than 300 meals are served each school day in the school cafeteria. And then the final component of the food program, in, in late 2016, the post-earthquake tent camp that was located next to Narive was dismantled by the government. And so many of those families were forced to move out of the area without the resources necessary to be self-sufficient. And many of those families have been relying on the food program for basic nutrition for their children. So even though they don't live in the T Plus Caso neighborhood any longer, they're still part of the community and are welcome to come to the food pantry to receive raw rice and beans. And some travel from as far as 30 miles away to get this food. Approximately 150 to 200 additional meals each week are provided to families uh, through this program. 
And so staving off hunger and malnutrition, allowing children to study without the distraction of hunger and allowing parents uh, to start to find some stability by directing the few resources that they do have to buy a useful item like a cooking pot or to purchase supplies to start a small business. That's a big part of the impact that you make. And thanks to, to generous donors uh, like BGR, children like Rolda can attend school and make the most of it. Rolda is a 12 year old young lady and often described by her teachers as a young motivated girl bubbling with excitement and curiosity. She calls school her safe space and refuge and is immensely grateful for the joy and discovery and friendship and stability that it brings to her life. The hot lunch that she gets at school every day is sadly often Rolda's only meal of the day. Because of the Father Jerry School and the love and education and support she receives there, Rolda's on track to building up the future she's, ima she's always imagined. One that was unclear before, but that's now possible a future where she can reach higher and go farther than anyone in her family ever has. The other piece of the support that we receive from Buddhist Global Relief is Nariveh's education programs. And we aim to foster the next generation of leaders in Haiti, children who are empowered, thoughtful, proud of their heritage and ready to work together for positive change. And the cornerstone of uh, these education efforts is the Father Jerry School. <clears throat> the curriculum at the Father Jerry School entails a combination of high economic uh, academic standards and teachings of respect, empathy, and civic duty among the students and, and community. The students are encouraged to help maintain the school and the surrounding yard, which helps develop their sense of responsibility and pride. And in addition, their parents are encouraged to get involved in their education to better support them, which is not a given in Haiti where many parents couldn't attend school and are unable to, to read or write. This approach creates a supportive environment for the students so they can become change agents in the community. And the Father Jerry School welcomed its first students on September 5th, 2016. Over 300 students ages three to 19 years old are currently in preschool through high school. I'd like you to meet Fania. She is the student on the far left. She's been part of Nariveh's scholarship program from the age of five. And then she transferred to the Father Jerry School in 2016 when we opened and was a member of the first graduating class in 2019. We are so incredibly proud of her journey. She's the first member of her family to finish high school. And Fania's hard work and determination coupled with the support of our generous donors, I have allowed her to take control of her future inspire those around her and foster an environment where she can succeed. Her dream of becoming a doctor to serve her community is not as out of reach as it once seemed, and she continues to receive our support as she pursues her college education. The Father Jerry School has done so much during this time of COVID-19 to, to try to make sure to follow all of the recommended guidelines and, and health and safety regulations. We've, we've spaced out the desks in the school, made sure that the students are wearing masks, um, provided hand washing stations. Uh, the meals are no longer served in the crowded cafeteria, but are moved, uh, they're made in the cafeteria and delivered up to the classrooms where the kids can eat in, in isolation in the classrooms. Um, we, we even make sp uh, use of the hallway space in order to make sure that the kids and the, and the teachers and, and staff are all able to stay safe during the time of COVID-19. What If Foundation is so grateful for the partnership and friendship that we enjoy with the Buddhist Global Relief and all who support their mission. And are, are, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for the partnership and also for the opportunity today to, to share our story. Thank you so much, Dave, for the beautiful presentation. Very, very inspiring. Thank you. And thank you so much. Our next uh, presentation is from Maitreya Charity. Uh, Maitreya Charity was established to support families affected by poverty to the Astro NGO, an organization established by the Tibetan Buddhist monk Panchen Otro Wenpoche in the capital city on, of Mongolia. BGR, BGR partners with Maitreya since 2018 to provide nutritious meals, school assistance, 
and social work services for school children. And for many of uh, these children, the lunch they receive is the only substantial meal of the day. We're glad to have uh, uh, Donna Washing um, on the board of Maitreya Charity with us today. Thank you for joining us, Donna. There, I'm unmuted. <laughs> You're welcome. And um, Gail Kamenishi was wanting to say hello. Do you know if she's here or not? I guess I'll go ahead and start the slideshow. So I'm going to share my screen. Sorry, Donna, I, I am here. Oh, you are, good. Um, speak up and uh, give an introduction, Gail. Gail is our uh, director right now. And um, go ahead, Gail. Thank you, Donna, and thank you, Kim. I represent Maitreya Charity in Seattle, and we support work being done in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. We are so deeply grateful for our partnership with Buddhist Global Relief. They do what we cannot do alone. Uh, Maitreya is a small group, and we've done various fundraisers in the past, and we have a handful of loyal and generous donors, but part of our program was in danger of closing. Uh, due to low reserves. In 2018, our board member, Sue Tomita, won a grant from Buddhist Global Relief, and that kept our work going. Thank you so much, Sue. We continue to work in your memory. Thank you, Buddhist Global Relief, and everyone here today. And now, Donna will talk more about our program. Donna. Thank you. Okay, so can you hear me, everybody? Yes, Donna. Okay. All right. I'm going to shrink that little thing. All right. So um, in 2001, Venerable Panchen Otro Rinpoche visited Mongolia with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, at the end of his visit, His Holiness asked Venerable Rinpoche to stay, to teach, and to help the Mongolian people. Since then, Panchen Otro Rinpoche has dedicated himself to what he considers his life's career continuing to visit Mongolia every summer that he could. COVID-19 Mongolian borders closure was only the second time that he missed a summer. The first was when he was ill. The collapse of the Soviet Union began a sudden and steady increase in poverty in Mongolia, which is why Venerable Rinpoche's charitable projects continue their work to reach and improve the lives of as many as the poorest children, women, and families as possible. When Rinpoche goes to Mongolia, besides tending to his programs and his religious duties, he visits the prisons, orphanages, and schools, including everyone he can in his umbrella of generosity, which is Israel Charity and its outreach. And Maitreya is the U.S. Um, charity that um, helps Israel's programs. The core of Israel NGO. Whoops, sorry, I'm using two computers. <laughs> And it's kind of funny, but I think it's going to work. Um, Israel's core mission is to prevent children from going onto the streets. And I want to briefly say that Joanna, another our newest board member, shared a video that our Irish partner, uh, John Ling, shared with her about what Rinpoche found when he got to Mongolia, which was literally children, um, hordes of children living under the streets in the sewers where there was um, heat available. And they would help each other go down at night and up each morning. <clears throat> um, priority is given to the care of, oh, my computer just jumped without me touching it. Priority is given to the welfare of children and their mothers. Working closely with local political and community representatives led to strategies of developing self-sustaining employment projects to prevent the disintegration of poor families. Access to education, medical and family support, skills training such as organic farming, traditional felting, and entrepreneurship are all priorities. In 2001, Israel's Community Center was built in the 9th Koru Bayangal district. So that's what you look up if you want to look on Google Earth, B-A-Y-A-N-G-O-L at the heart of one of the air districts of Ulaanbaatar, providing a multi-purpose building for the local community. There are approximately 11,150 people living in 
this particular district, Bayangal district. At the invitation of local governors, Israel NGO established two smaller centers, one in the rural area of Gatshirt, an hour west of Ulaanbaatar, and one in Andershil in the Gobi Desert region. <clears throat> this picture was taken from the upper floor of Israel Center, the community building. The Mongolian people's traditional nomadic way of life has long been impacted and endangered by both world and regional political, economic, and climate changes. It contrasts the vision of Mongolia in the first slide, herds of animals running freely on an unfenced land, and our notions of the nomadic life with the reality of the Gare districts. With nearly 800,000 people, living in Ulaanbaatar's Gare districts alone, that's more than 25% of all Mongolian citizens. That um, is from the Borgen Project, which I discovered while doing my research. With this in mind, the poor living conditions that these people face are especially concerning. The use of coal and wood is particularly problematic and continues um, to contribute to emergency accidents and unhealthy air conditions. Um, this is our hot meal project. This is a kindergarten near the Israel Center. Um, it, Israel pays for its, um, our kids who are attending this kindergarten's hot meal fee, or, um, kindergarten fees. So they get hot meal at Israel um, for their breakfast. They go to school. Um, Mongolian schools charge fees for all students, which is a hardship for poor families. During the early phases of COVID-19, the on-site hot meal project operated by dropping off food at pickup sites. In Mongolia, because of a combination of early closed borders, lower tourism, and good sanitation measures and education, transmission rates remain low. There was the added benefit that the normal high uh, incidence of yearly flu deaths, which are common among the poor here, went down. Since the infection transmission rate in Mongolia remains so low, schools have been able to open, which is wonderful for our hot meal project and access to education. Here's a menu of uh, the types of meals they feed their children and uh, feed the children. And um, they also, like um, Dave's program, try to work with having a Protein, grain, a soup with vegetables and a fruit juice. And uh, my lovely younger son made the cute food gifts. Um, here on the left, you can see an example of the meal um, in, uh, in the little prayer at the beginning of the meal. And then on the right is actually a picture of after the little Buddha class on Saturdays that the children can come to and bring their moms and then they can have a little snack after, which is pretty special. <clears throat> um, this is our kitchen and um, the cook. Um, this kitchen, the Canadian Embassy helped to equip. Um, refrigerator broke down and a new one had to be purchased recently. And last year, my Maitreya Charity donated a dish sanitizing machine. We didn't even know how timely that was. Um, here is a teacher tutoring children at the Israel Center classroom before they go to school after having their hot breakfast. Um, this is, here you can see a mix of the types of housing that comprise the neighborhoods around Israel's community. So the Gare district, um, which is Gare, shacks, all kinds of housing, but the um, that you could put together simply, it kind of surrounds Ulaanbaatar. And if you do look on Google Earth and you're up high, you can see that ring around Ulaanbaatar. Um, people live not only in garrison shacks, but in old Soviet structures and in houses, sometimes with services going to them, sometimes not. The cooking method of using a pot over an open fire on or close to the floor in many of these homes leads to accidents that badly burn children each year. Israel's emergency aid funds are able to help with medical bills as well as aftercare supplies. Um, and of course, it would be lovely to have other solutions to that too for any um, concerned minds with good ideas out there. 
Um, this happens to be at one of the state organizations. Gail Kamenichi visited in 2018 and delivered some, they delivered some supplies there, including art supplies. Um, she noted that if you look at the shelves in the back and the cubbies in the back, that in our schools would be full of belongings and books and overflowing with papers are bare. And I noticed when I went to Mongolia in 2008 and I uh, brought school supplies for a monastery there. And I noticed that they did have some leftover from the last teacher, but when teachers are temporary and um, schools aren't taken care of, which was the case in um, this place in the country, then um, you don't really have anything to work with. All right, so um, Billy, um, Buddha's Global Relief asked for some stories. So I'm going to try to rip through these so you can learn about these lives of our most impacted children in, these era, in this area. Kunu and Barka's story. Um, <clears throat> I want to say in cooperation with Jampa Ling that um, ACE will implements a sponsorship program for the most vulnerable children. And so these next few slides feature people who benefit from our hot meal program, but who would greatly benefit from sponsors. Um, Kunu and his younger brother, Barkas, live with their mother who works as a nurse in a trauma center. The hot meal program um, su supplies them with a hot meal daily, which improves their nutrition and health. They also benefit from the educational support that ACEL provides to all of their hot meal um, project recipients. Their mother became the only caregiving parent when their father died in an accident, leaving their monthly income at around 600,000 Mongolian tukriks a month. It sounds like a lot, but it's about $315. Um, their mother works in ships, leaving little time to spend with their children who live in their own dwelling. This leaves Kunu as the older boy to take care of his brother, do all the household chores such as cooking, and fetching water from the well, as well as making wood or coal fires to heat the house during winter months. Their disabled grandmother lives next door to their house in her gear and is able to watch over the boys. A gear is a year, I don't know if you caught that on the other slide, <clears throat> but it's not a, um, she's not able to help with chores. <clears throat> in spite of these difficulties, the children are good at their studies. Burma, staff for Israel's programs, characterizes these boys as humble, quiet, interested in their studies, especially math. She says they can use help with suitable clothing for the changing seasons as they rely on buying secondhand clothing. They also crucially need help with dental work at last report as each of them had about half a dozen sick teeth which raised their risk for other health problems. This is Namuna on the right holding the baby. She's 15, she's in 10th grade. After her father died in a car accident, her mother, suffering from alcoholism, was unable to care for her and disappeared. Namuna Kiri currently lives with an uncle and aunt who work on a construction site from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., leaving her to take care of the cleaning, cooking, and the care of their four children, three of them here with Namuna, all while attending school and trying to keep up with homework. The household has no cooking, stove, or washing machine, so she does everything by hand. She has no time for improving her studies or attending other activities at the school. She also does not have a permanent, safe, trusted home as she moves around relatives' homes. I like her little school book. She was distressed that she couldn't um, improve her work, and that's the little, maybe the little red marks. Um, this is Narant Sastral, who is 10 years old. She has the red hat on, the baseball cap. A baseball club um, who lives in the area get, um, got hats for all the hot meal children. So it's really sweet. And it helps me know which child she is. She lives with her mother, her aunt, her older sister, and four younger siblings. Her mother has not worked since she gave birth last year. This year, during COVID-19 quarantine, a tragic cooking accident left Narant Sastral's infant sister with third degree burns. Doctors advise that the baby will need an ear surgery next year. The children's father then left the family by taking away their care with another woman. So in 
these gears come apart into a long bundled roll of sticks and canvas and they're either put in the back of a pickup truck these days, most likely, or they're dragged by horses. So literally, the father took the home, rolled it up, put it up, and left with another woman. Um, Narant, just hard to pronounce her name, Narant Strahl's family have since been living with their aunts in a spare room of a small house. Narant Sestral is in the fourth grade and attends classes to learn the traditional musical instrument called Morin Kur, the horse head fiddle. And Burma reports that she's an excellent student who's extremely excited about learning foreign languages at school. Like most children in the Gare district, Narant Sestral must do more than go to school. She helps her mother around the house, cooks and fetches water from the well, which is two kilometers from her home, in 20 liter cans. This family's children are experiencing severe malnutrition and wasting caused both by lack of food and the quality of available food. And now I would like to pass this along to Joanne Young, our newest board member and a longtime supporter of Maitreya Charity. Thank you, Donna. That, yeah. was, that was really nice. Um, I just want to say something very brief. My name is Joanne Young. I'm the newest addition to the Maitreya board just last month. Um, I manage a small charitable foundation in Seattle, and we've supported Osteral Center through Maitreya Charity since 2003. Um, I met Rinpoche when Osteral was newly founded, and I've contributed, not I, we have contributed from the foundation almost every year since then, although our grants are fairly small. It was clear uh, to us how deeply thoughtful and strategic Rinpoche was and is, and how much the people in Mongolia loved him. And I thought in my secular mind, I thought there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of leverage in a Rinpoche. <laughs> Um, and his staff is, is very dedicated. They work very, very hard. In 2006, I visited Mongolia and I stayed at Osral for a couple days. I saw that the local children were given hot cooked lunches at the center along with social work services and health advice and education, safety and some playtime. Um, since then, Osral's services have expanded dramatically including a felting operation where women can make a living. Um, and I'm always just astonished at how much good they do with a very, very small budget. So when I heard that Maitreya had received such a very significant and consequential gift for Osral's hot meal program from Buddhist Global Relief, I was so pleased and grateful for your compassion and your choice to help feed Ulaanbaatar's poorest kids. So I just wanted to chime in and say thank you very, very much for your choice and that Asral makes excellent use of any funds that it's given. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joanne. Donna and Gail for the presentation. It's truly very, very inspiring to us. And thank you for our partnership to the years. So I guess, uh, I hope that you enjoy, um, this kind of basically ends our partner's presentation. I hope you enjoy the inspiring presentations and the impact of your support on the lives of tens of thousands of women and children around the world. Uh, please uh, visit BuddhistGlobalRelief.org to find out more about our programs. And please consider making a gift today to help those in need at this very critical time. And thank you so much for your support and for being with us here today. Thank you. Go ahead, Donna. Oh, I just said thank you so much for thank doing that. You. That's all. So at this point, I would like to transition to Venbo Sampton for the continuation of the program. Thank you.
want to introduce you to one more organization doing good things for others. In their generosity, Buddhist Global Relief offers 10% of funds raised during an Action to Feed the Hungry event to a local charity. Our charity of choice is Youth Emergency Services, located in our nearby town of Newport, Washington. Youth Emergency Services, or YES, looks out for homeless and at-risk youth, providing all kinds of support, including food, especially since COVID. Abbey Monastics have served, served on the YES board of directors for many years now. Sarah Phillips, Executive Director, is here to tell us about their good work. Thank you. Thank you, Shabasti Abbey and the BJRN um, for inviting us to this wonderful gathering. Um, we're, we're just honored. Thank you so much. Um, yes, of Ponderay County, from its humble beginnings of the back of Judy Lee's van, um, believes that no young person should be without a safe place to live with adults who care for them, with electricity, running water, and enough nutritious food to eat. The mission to support and advocate, feed, clothe, and safely house youth and young adults was born as the need here was becoming more obvious and there were no other service providers to fill that gap. We are in rural Northeastern Washington with a history of multi-generational poverty, many families in isolated locations and even off the grid. This became coupled with drug abuse from the years of free flowing opiates into our community and the great recession of 2008. Pharmaceutical companies flooded Ponderay County with more than 6.6 .6 million cheap painkillers from 2006 to 2012, enough for 73 pills per person in the county per year. While the opioid epidemic has peaked about a decade ago, the consequences here continue. It cascaded into a community crisis which persists with some people using heroin and methamphetamine as doctors scaled back um, their opioid prescriptions, sometimes without any replacement for pain relief. There was so much that was misunderstood about addiction that help when it came, came too late for many of them. The recession hit hard as well and kids began falling through the cracks of already fragile family structures, living in substandard conditions, possibly with no heat or running water, couch surfing with friends, not knowing when the next meal was going to come and when it was going to be available and becoming far more vulnerable for exploitation. The school failure rate was a clear message that for some kids, things were sliding dangerously sideways. Yes, graduated out of the back of that van, and we now have a drop-in center for youth and young adults where they can wash clothes, take showers, eat a hot meal, pick up clothing, food, and basic essentials, do homework, and just be kids hanging out with other kids. We have case managers with lived homelessness experience that meet kids where they are, and help young people put life back to right step by step with active assistance and advocacy, obtaining medical insurance and care, critical documents like social security cards and IDs. Until COVID, our case managers were going into schools to meet with kids and school counselors to help keep them engaged in their education and their goals. Now skills, schools are closed for the second time here and we can no longer accept all kids at our center. Sharply restricted numbers and strong safety measures do allow them to make appointments to access our services in addition to using our Wi-Fi so that they can finish their homework as best as they can. But this new isolation again threatens their mental health and their safety. After COVID, things have taken another sharp turn for the economy in our community. One of our major employers has finally gone bankrupt and put more than 150 people out of work. Our county now has the highest rate of unemployment in Washington and many jobs are low skilled labor and below living wages. Young people have left unstable homes and are couch surfing, sometimes up to nine kids per household in the last months. Food insecurity has skyrocketed for many families with children. Yes was providing some food care packages for weekend use to about 12 young people a week. We are now needing to secure and deliver a week's worth of food for up to 80 young people a week every week. Case managers are driving over 300 miles a month to secure food from stores and food banks and then to deliver them to kids that are living outside of town and off the grid. We are also taking food across the border into Idaho as we have identified homeless and at-risk youth there. We are a border town. Our community is blessing us with the help that they can afford with many bringing in non-perishable food and cash donations. 
several philanthropies in our county have stepped up with cash as well as members of the faith community and citizens just of Pend Oreille County. Initially, we anticipated six months of revenue to provide in response to COVID and we misjudged as did many others. Our infection numbers are rising, school lunches are not readily available and we have hit our six month mark. We expect to be able to continue and thank everyone for their generous support. Milo Edwards is a past participant of YES and now an honored employee. He is here to recount a bit of his lived experience. He has a singular and compassionate voice and I am personally so glad for you to meet him. Thank you so much for our involvement in this moment. We really appreciate it. Hi everyone. Milo. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Milo Edwards. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about my experience um, like uh, in the YES program as well as just growing up um, in, I, I grew up on the other side, on the Idaho side of the border in Old Town right next to Newport. Um, and I ended up moving to Newport when I was 16. Um, I was one of the young people who was really impacted um, by the recession and like the opioid epidemic. Um, my father um, became addicted to meth and um, well, his drug of choice was heroin and he's um, unfortunately still addicted to that today. Uh, growing up, he was in and out of prison and my mom did her best to try to take care of my brothers and I'm the middle child. Um, I have one brother a year older than me and another brother three years younger than me. Um, and it was pretty difficult for us to be able to get food. I think I remember um, hating summertime because I wasn't able to be in school because school was kind of like a savior for me for a while because I knew I would at least get some form of breakfast or lunch. Um, for me personally, there was a bit of an added challenge because I also have some dietary restrictions because I've been allergic to dairy since I was a kid. So even when I was able to get those meals um, at school, I'd have to give away half of it because I couldn't eat it or I'd break out in hives and get really sick. Um, it was pretty difficult during the summers when we weren't able to go to school and get that food. I remember one summer, I think I was probably about 13, uh, the only food that we had in the house was this big Costco-sized bag of pancake mix. And fortunately, it, was, it wasn't dairy. It didn't have dairy in it. But um, in order to make it to where I could still eat the pancake mix, we just used water. So for two weeks, we ate nothing but pancake mix made with water. We didn't have butter or syrup. And to this day, I don't like pancakes. <laughs> Um, it was, it was pretty difficult for a while. And then it got to the point where like with my dietary restrictions, like all I'd eat would be rice. And then I eventually got a job working at, um, a restaurant, uh, like a, just a local burger restaurant. And then like half my meals would just be French fries. <laughs> um, it was really difficult, like not being able to eat very much. And then as my housing situation and just family situation kind of just kept snowballing, I ended up uh, beginning to couch surf when I was 15. And then at the age of 16, I um, finally left home officially and um, came to the Washington side of the border um, because I felt a little bit safer there than in Idaho, even though it's still not very great. So I, I enrolled in school at the Newport High School for my senior year. Um, and through the connections of a counselor, the school counselor there, I was able to meet um, people at the YES program. The first person I met was the old executive director, Martina, and one of the case managers, Liz. And they were able to help me receive services because I didn't even know that YES existed because when I was on the Idaho side, um, there wasn't anything like YES and they weren't yet able to provide services to people on that side of the border. So it was really nice to be able to um, get help from organizations like YES and have adults that cared for me. And I remember the first time I went into the drop-in center after school, I had told Liz, I was like, I can't 
really eat any of this stuff. She's like, okay, what can you eat? I'll take you to Safeway. Like we'll stock the fridge and freezer with stuff you can eat. So anytime you come in here, you'll have food. And that was like really important to me because a lot of times people are like, you can't eat dairy. You're fine. It's like, I'll die. <laughs> um, so it like that meant a lot to me. And I got the privilege um, after about a year of just being a client at Yes. Um, and during that time I was a client, I was able to finish high school early through the help of the Ponderay River School and the staff there and um, being in the host home program and being able to just kind of live and survive and work at my own pace. I was able to finish high school about six or seven months early and I was able to get emancipated and become a legal adult before the age of 18 uh, through the help of people at YES. And then shortly thereafter, I was able to become involved with um, a state uh, program, uh, like a youth uh, action board for young people with lived experience and we're able to kind of, and I've been able to turn that into somewhat of a career for myself. And I'm currently enrolled in college at Washington State University to uh, focus and study on social science and continue trying to help end youth homelessness and use my experience um, for positive change. I really enjoyed work. I got to work at YES, uh, I was working there in person um, before I moved here to Pullman. Uh, now I'm just doing remote work as I'm also a full-time full -time college student. It was really impactful for me to be able to help with uh, getting all the food packages together while working at, like in person at YES and help make sure that we got stuff that young people like eating and my brothers um, are two of the people who receive those packages and my little brother like he's always so excited for them because uh, one thing that I've always heard about people who get the food packages from yes is they're like these are stuff that we actually want to eat because a lot of young people are like I've heard kids um, sometimes when they're just talking about maybe what they want for Christmas I literally saw a child write food that's not from the food bank. And one thing that YES does well is pick out foods that kids want and are excited about and stuff that you don't have to cook, but they still taste good. And my little brother is always excited for the cans of chili and <laughs> the fruit leathers. And there's like lots of good snacks, but it's also healthy stuff. And it's like something that'll keep you through the week. And I'm glad that there's programs like YES now that um, when I was my little brother's age, I didn't have available, but now he does. And because he's not in school, he's not able to get those meals that like were really supplemental to us during um, the school year. So yeah, I just want to um, make sure to shout out. Yes. <laughs> so I always, I always try to, even though I'm now an employee, I know that I wouldn't really be anywhere where I am without the program and without like the support that they give. And I know that through the support of youth emergency services that there's lots of other young people like me who can hopefully be able to climb out of that poverty and reach the next step and go to college or find a career that they love. Um, and something as simple as a weekly food care package is the next, is the first step. So thank you. Thank you, Milo, and yes, and all of the people who are doing extraordinary work. You know, we read the news and uh, it looks like the world is quite bleak and the stories we're hearing are not good ones, but the, the key point that I wanna emphasize and that I think Venerable Sangay Kadro will lead us in a meditation shortly is to see that in spite of all the suffering, there's also tremendous kindness and uh, we can participate and be a part of that. So Venerable Sangay Kadro will now lead us in some meditation. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so for me personally, one of the most beautiful and powerful meditations found in the Tibetan tradition is the meditation on the kindness of others. It helps us to open our hearts, 
feel gratitude and appreciation for the many ways others have helped us in the past and continue to help us now and will continue in the future. And it enhances our loving kindness, compassion, and the wish to do whatever we can to help others in return. So let's just take a few minutes to contemplate some of the points from this beautiful meditation. So make yourself as comfortable as you can. You can let your eyes close or leave them partially open. Let your thoughts settle down. Let your breath flow in and out in a natural, steady rhythm. So just the fact that we are alive with the body that we have depends on the kindness of others. Our parents and whoever else was there in the early part of our life, taking care of us when our body was so small and helpless and we were completely dependent on others just to survive. So try to imagine yourself at that time in your life and the people who took care of you. And without the, the kindness of those people, you wouldn't be here today. There are many other people we depend on, even though we may never meet. The people who produce the food that we eat every day, who produce the clean water and other beverages that we drink, the clothes that we wear, the house or apartment we live in, the furniture and appliances we use, the books that we read, the music we listen to, and so on. So absolutely everything that we own and use and enjoy was made for others, made by others for us. So we benefit from the the hard work, the kindness, the dedication of those other people. Another group of people we depend on are teachers. Those who taught us reading, writing, math, and so on, basic knowledge. And all the other knowledge and skills that we've learned throughout our life that enable us to now get a job, live on our own, support ourselves, function in society, travel, and make a contribution to the world. Get a sense of the kindness of teachers and all the other people involved in the education system that made it possible for us to learn what we know today.
And for those of us who wish to learn and practice the Dharma, other beings are essential. We learn the Dharma from our teachers, usually in the company of fellow students. And we're usually part of a community of practitioners, other people who support us in our practice. We also need others in order to engage in certain Dharma practices, such as giving or dana. How could we practice that without other people, other beings serving as the recipients of our gifts? Also the practice of ethical conduct, which involves consciously refraining from harming others, understanding that they want to be happy and to not suffer. So without others being there, we wouldn't be able to practice and develop ethical conduct. And then there's the practice of the four Brahma Viharas or the four immeasurables, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So how could we cultivate these beautiful states of mind, which are so beneficial for ourselves as well as for others in the world without other beings being there as the objects of these meditations? So as a conclusion to this meditation, see if you can feel a deep and sincere sense of appreciation and gratitude for other people and other beings, understanding that they want to be happy and to not suffer just as you do, and aspire to do what you can in your life to benefit them to the best of your ability and to not harm them. So here at the Abbey, we incorporate thoughts like this each day um, before the main meal of the day, which is lunch. Um, We um, pause and contemplate the kindness of others and the wish to repay their kindness and, and offer the food and contemplate that we're taking this food as nourishment to have energy to carry on with our Dharma practice and make our lives beneficial for others. So I would like to invite members of the uh, Shravasti Abbey community to join me in um, demonstrating 
these practices that we do each day. I know many of you online are, have uh, had lunch with us more than a few times. Um, so join in with your muted. Um, if those who are interested in learning how we use food as a part of our um, practice, Venerable Children has published The Compassionate Kitchen, um, which details all of these prayers. But we'll do the five contemplations that we do before lunch. Our lunch is coming soon. And we'll make the, and chant the food offering together. I contemplate all the causes and conditions and the kindness of others by which I have received this faithful duty. I contemplate my own practice, constantly trying to improve it. I contemplate my mind, cautiously guarding it from wrongdoing, greed, and other defilements. I contemplate this food, treating it as wondrous medicine to nourish my body. I contemplate the aim of Buddhahood, accepting and consuming this food in order to accomplish it. Oma Hong, Oma Hong, Oma Great compassion and protect all teachers, merit and good qualities, ocean, the the I bow, purity freeing from the cat, and freeing from the lower realms, unique supreme ultimate reality, to the Dharma that is peace I bow. Having freed themselves, showing the path to freedom too. Well established in the trainings. The holy field endowed with good qualities. To the Sangha I bow. To the supreme teacher, the precious Buddha. To the supreme refuge, the holy precious Dharma. To the supreme guides, the precious Sangha. To all the objects of refuge we make this offering. May we and all those around us never be separated from the triple gem in any of our lives. May we always have the opportunity to make offerings to them. And may we continuously receive their blessings and inspiration to progress along the path. By seeing this food as medicine, I will consume it without attachment or complaint, not to increase my arrogance, strength, or good looks, but solely to sustain my life. So we've talked a lot today about food as medicine. And... Um, Today, our event is to inspire generosity and to invite um, your participation. Now, and also for the people online and also for in the future, we recorded it today. We will post this on the Shravasti Abbey YouTube channel, so it will have a life uh, long after this morning or whatever your time zone is. I've seen the Singaporeans here. It's the middle of the night for you. Um, but our purpose is to invite everyone to support Buddhist global relief in their work. So if you are inspired by what you've heard, tell other people. Um, direct them to this video if you want on the Shravasti Abbey YouTube channel, but most importantly, direct them to the Buddhist Global Relief website. There you will find the um, opportunity to give online, or you can also send a check 
to address 2020 Route 301, Carmel, New York, 10513, and you'll find that on their website as well. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the average cost of groceries each month for one person in the United States is $165 to $345. So that's a range. That averages $252 a month, $63 a week, or $8.40, $8.40 a day per person. So think about where you fall in that range. And given all that we have experienced from the kindness of others, think about what one day's groceries, one week's groceries, one month's groceries can do to benefit people through the Maitreya Foundation, through the um, What If Foundation, for Youth Emergency Services, for all the many projects that Buddhist Global Relief um, supports. And um, don't be stingy. Let's uh, take this opportunity for those of us who have, to the extent that we have, and believe me, every one of us looking at a computer has. We have a lot. And so let's, reflecting on the kindness that we have received so much in our lives, be a force to be able to make an offering as well to Buddhist Global Relief for their beautiful work. So we will turn back to Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi and have you please give us a few more words of meditation and also dedicate our merit to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so. I want to thank again, to thank all of the partners who have come and given the presentation this afternoon or your time this morning. This morning. And we want to end with a short meditation. So again, take a comfortable sitting position. And close your eyes. And again, let the mind settle down by focusing on a few rounds of mindful in and out breathing. And now we're going to do a kind of universal or global meditation on compassion. And what I find to be a useful segue into this meditation is the statement of the Buddha that it's very difficult to find a single person who at one time or another has not been our own mother or father or our own brother or sister for our own son and daughter. So let us sweep our mind over the planet Earth. And we could just focus in on a few sort of hot spots of hunger, poverty, illness, We take some of the places that we focused on today, turn the mind towards the children of Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, and again, consider that these children might be our own sons and daughters or our own parents from past existences, now living in dependence upon our kindness, our compassion, our generosity. Then turn, move the mind over to Cambodia, where we have a project 
with girls from the poorest stratum of Cambodian society, providing them with food support to continue their high school education and even to continue on, some of them, to continue on to college and university. And again, think of these girls as being our own daughters or our own mothers from a past existence. Again, depending on our kindness, generosity, our compassion. Then move the mind over now to India, to the Punjab region, where thousands and thousands of farmers, oppressed by debt, commit suicide, leaving behind their wives and children. and feel that these wives, the women left behind, are our own, perhaps sisters or mothers, and the children are our children. And here, BGR has a project with a partner organization, which is providing vocational training to these widows of the farmers who have committed suicide. And again, extend to them the feeling of our kindness, compassion, and generosity. And then move the mind further now to Africa, to Côte d'Ivoire, where we have a project together with the Helen Keller International to help expectant women, new mothers, and their infants to receive proper nutrition so that the babies can grow up strong and healthy. And again, extend to them the feeling of kindness, compassion, and generosity. and then move the mind across to Haiti, to the many children who are being benefited and helped by the work of the What If Foundation. And we have two other partners in Haiti, actually three partners, also providing food support to children and educational opportunities for children. And 
I again consider these children to be our children and extend to them feelings of kindness, compassion, and generosity. And then bring the mind to the United States, where especially because of COVID-19, but also even before the, the pandemic, so many families, people were suffering from hunger and malnutrition. And we, Buddhist Global Relief, we're doing our own little part to help by providing each month donations to the organization Feeding America, which is a kind of umbrella organization for the food banks around the United States. And again, extend feelings of deep compassion to our fellow Americans who face a constant daily struggle just to obtain enough food. So let the mind now spread out broadly over the entire planet, the entire human population, generating the deep wish that all people in this world will receive the basic requisites, the material supports, the social support, the spiritual support to lead a decent, dignified, and meaningful life. And then let us think of our own small contribution towards helping other human beings, repaying the kindness of other human beings who might have been our mothers, fathers, from many past lives. And then let us just rejoice for about 30 seconds in this opportunity to serve humanity. Okay, I want to conclude by reciting a short blessing. So let's join the hands together. Sabitio viva jantu, saburogo vinasatu, mate bhavatu antarayo, suki digayuko bhava, Bhavatu sabha mangalang, rakantu sabha devata, sabha budanu bhavena, sadasoti bhavantu te, bhavatu sabha mangalang, rakantu sabha devata, sabha dhamanu bhavena, sadasoti bhavantu te, bhavatu sabha mangalang, Rakantu sabha devata sabha sanganu bhavena sada soti bhavantu te. Okay, the program for the day is finished now. <laughs> Thank you, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Thank you, Buddhist Global Relief, for your inspiration and your work. And uh, 
Everyone else, you can join us for sharing the Dharma Day tomorrow, starting at 10 a.m. Pacific. And uh, please make sure you make your offerings and share all the opportunities to give with your friends. Thanks. Okay, so thank you, Kim and Mary Helen and Carl. Carla's here, I guess. Yeah, and also our speakers from the partner organizations. Again, thank you all for contributing.